Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today we are taking our first look at Intel's Tiger Lake H45 laptop processors and how they perform with a comprehensive benchmark analysis of the Intel Core i7-11800H. This CPU was announced a little over a week or so ago, and while the NDA on performance expired earlier this week, we didn't have quite enough time to prepare our usual exhaustive review. So here we are today with all of the details. If you want all the information on Intel's 11th Gen H series processors for gaming and high performance productivity laptops, then I'd suggest going back to check out our news coverage. But here's the basic summary. Tiger Lake H45 brings with it eight Willow Cove CPU cores, a massive overhaul from the previous Skylake derivatives Intel has been using for years now. While Willow Cove and Tiger Lake have been around for a little while now in ultra portable systems, these eight core designs are new and specifically designed for high performance systems, bringing Intel's 10 nanometer Superfin technology to a higher power class for the first time. Along with new CPU cores and double the amount of cores that are available in Ultra Portables, 11th Gen H-Series CPUs also bring new XE integrated graphics, 20 lanes of PCIe 4.0 connectivity, integrated Thunderbolt 4, and a whole range of other stuff. The Cry 7 11800H we're reviewing today is Intel's primary mainstream offering that will be used in the majority of mid-range to high-end laptops. There's just one Core i7 model this year, and this is it, flanked by the 6-core Core i5 models below and the higher clocked Core i9s above. The 11800H brings 8 cores and 16 threads with 24 megabytes of L3 cache, a 2.3 GHz base clock at 45 watts, plus turbo frequencies that range from 4.6 GHz on up to 2 cores to 4.2 GHz all core. Then we get an XE integrated GPU design with 32 execution units and clock speeds up to 1450 MHz. Compared to Core i7 models in the prior generation, this is a substantial update, not just in terms of architecture. Intel has consolidated the lineup to include just an 8-core processor, whereas previously both 6 and 8-core models fell under this brand. So this is a big update on a chip like the Core i7-10750H, as it packs two extra cores. However, maximum clock speeds have regressed from as high as 5.1 GHz on the Core i7-10875H to just 4.6 GHz here, a deficit Intel are hoping to make up with higher IPC. The test system for today's video is likely not an Intel reference platform, but a production laptop from Gigabyte, the new Aero 15 OLED. Nothing wrong with testing Intel provided reference machines, of course, I just prefer to use systems consumers will actually be able to purchase on store shelves. It's more of a real world test, as Intel would like to say, so Gigabyte have kindly provided the Aero 15. This is more of a creator slash productivity focused system than Gigabyte's Aorus lineup, so the Aero features a gorgeous 15.6 inch 4K OLED panel, which is amazing for content creation and viewing. Similar sort of design that Gigabyte has been using for a few generations now with the slim display bezels, full-sized RGB backlit keyboard, and a great selection of ports. Also, did I mention that OLED display? But more importantly, it's powerful on the inside. Along with the Core i7-11800H, we have an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070 GPU running at 90 to 105 watts using NVIDIA's studio drivers. There's 32 gigabytes of dual channel DDR4 3200 out of the box, although we used 16 gigabytes for our testing, which is standardized across all test laptops, one terabyte of storage inside as well. For today's testing, we have run the Core i7-11800H in its standard 45 watt configuration, which is accessible through the gaming mode in Gigabyte's control center software. This includes a PL2 state of 109 watts for boost applications, much higher than the 65 watts or so we typically see on equivalent AMD machines. However, this has always been the case for Intel. In contrast, AMD boosts for a lot longer than Intel. The boost period on this 11800H unit is quite short. I also understand though that a lot of laptops do have the capabilities to run H-series processors above 45 watts, so while the majority of our testing will be done at 45 watts across all laptops, I'll also include some power scaling figures at the end so we can see how the 11800H compares to other processors up in the higher power ranges. 45 watts though is the default and also what the CPU mostly falls back to under heavy GPU load, uh, which is why we use it. As for the benchmarks today, the focus will be primarily on productivity testing. There will be a small section on gaming at the end, but as this laptop uses a GPU configuration that we haven't tested before, we can't do as much apples to apples testing. Hopefully in the coming weeks, we will have the ability to do a big benchmark video comparing Intel and AMD and gaming with the same GPU. 
We'll kick off the benchmarking as always with a look at Cinebench R20 multi-threading. The Cry7 11800H is significantly faster than any prior generation Intel mobile CPU in this test, coming in a massive 35% faster than the Cry7 10870H it's replacing, and nearly 60% ahead of the i7 10750H. This allows Intel's Tiger Lake CPU to close the substantial gap between Ryzen and 10th gen that was established with AMD's Ryzen 4000 lineup at the start of last year. However, despite huge gains over the prior generation, the performance Intel have been able to achieve is only sufficient for matching the Ryzen 7 4800H from last year. The 11800H is still 9% slower than the 5800H. That's quite competitive, but the margin isn't close enough to say they are equal, as ultimately the 11800H falls between the 5800H and 5600H. While Intel is unable to match AMD in multi-threading, Single-thread performance is a strength of their Tiger Lake designs, as we've seen from previous coverage of their ultra-portable processors. Even clocked at just 4.6GHz instead of the 5GHz we know Willow Cove can do, the 11800H is able to beat the 5800H by 4%, which gives it performance in this test around the mark of AMD's higher tier Ryzen 9 5900HX. The 5900HX also clocks up to 4.6GHz, indicating that Willow Cove and Zen 3 have similar IPC in this workload. You'll see similar margins in Cinebench R23, I know some viewers will want these numbers from Maxon's newer benchmark, so I'll show them here, but ultimately this doesn't change much from our Cinebench R20 conclusion. Handbrake is less favourable for Intel compared to Cinebench. In our benchmark run, the 11800H ended up 14% slower than the Ryzen 7 5800H, more around the mark of the 35 watt Ryzen 7 5800HS, suggesting Tiger Lake is less efficient in this power class than Ryzen 5000. However, Intel have beaten their previous Core i7 parts by at least 20% when comparing core for core, and this new design is also outperforming the Core i9-10980HK. In CPU-based rendering with Blender, again, the 11800H is quite a bit slower than Ryzen, 15% slower in this particular workload comparing Core i7 to Ryzen 7. Again, we see a 19% performance improvement over the previous generation of H-series processors, but this isn't enough to close the gap even to AMD's Ryzen 7 4800H from the prior generation at 45 watts. One of the largest outliers in our test suite was code compilation in Sigwin, where gen-on-gen -gen performance only improved by 9% when comparing the 11800H to the 10870H, which led to a significant performance deficit in comparison to AMD's Ryzen processors. However, that doesn't tell the full story for code compilation, as in our Chromium compile benchmark, the 11800H is much more competitive, just 3% behind the 5800H, so effectively delivering the same sort of performance. This presented a 21% performance uplift over the 10870H and 41% over the 10750H, which is what you want to see from an architectural overhaul. At this point in the review, I'd normally talk about Microsoft Office performance as measured in PC Mark 10. However, I had a few issues running this application on our test system, resulting in scores lower than what we've already seen from quad core Tiger Lake systems. I assume this is some sort of bug, so we'll move on, but I just want to include a note here as to why we haven't shown results for that benchmark that we normally include uh, in this particular review. Our custom Excel test was fine, however, so we got a good look at number crunching. In this test, the 11800H is only marginally faster than prior generation processors like the 10870H and meeting the performance of the 10980HK, possibly due to clock speed deficits. However, that's still enough to outperform the Ryzen 7 5800H by a slim 3% margin. So whether you choose Tiger Lake or Ryzen, the Excel experience should be similar. In 7-zip compression, it's another strong showing from the Core i7-11800H, matching the performance of the Ryzen 7 5800H and Core i9-10980HK, and beating the Core i7-10870H by a 13% margin. These sorts of benchmarks are always complicated by boost periods, all-core turbos and those sorts of things, where the 10980HK is a bit of a beast, but this is still a solid result. In decompression, however, Intel once again gets beaten by AMD as Ryzen 5000 processors are particularly strong in this common workload. The 11800H is 15% slower than the 5800H here, despite a 20% performance improvement over the 10870H, which highlights just how large the performance delta was in prior generations. Normally, you'd be very happy with the 20% performance improvement, but in these sorts of multi-thread workloads, unfortunately, it isn't quite enough. 
On the other hand, in MATLAB, the Cry 7 11800H is the clear choice, with 15% higher performance on offer than the Ryzen 7 5800H, the largest margin in favor of Intel that we've seen so far. The margins to other Intel processors are similar to previous benchmarks, 27% faster than the Cry 7 10870H for example, but with Intel's larger L3 cache and higher boost power limits, it does end up with the winning combination in this test. For AES-256 cryptography performance as measured by SysSoftware's Sandra, Intel benefits hugely from their new architecture, seeing performance more than double that of their prior architecture thanks to improved AES acceleration. Intel also end up faster than AMD, about 13% ahead here core for core, which is a strong showing. In Acrobat PDF exporting, performance is very similar to previous single-threaded workloads that we've looked at. Performance is 9% higher than the Cry 7 10870H, which pushes the 11800H above the Ryzen 7 5800H, ending up 5% ahead. It's actually slower than the 11370H here, as the 11370H tops out at 4.8GHz, not 4.6GHz, but it's still a good result for Intel all up. Next up, we have Adobe Photoshop using the Puget Systems benchmark. Another modest performance uplift in this lightly threaded application gen on gen, with the 11800H coming in 11% faster than the 10870H. This puts the 11800H slightly behind the Ryzen 7 5800H, but ultimately both processors are going to deliver a very similar experience in this application, as the overall lightly threaded performance of both processors is pretty close. For interest's sake, I'm including DaVinci Resolve Studio results, even though this application is more GPU bound when rendering, just to see how the 11800H might stack up in a reasonable laptop configuration. The basics here are that it performs as expected. We see more performance than a 10870H laptop with a slower GPU, as whenever the benchmark is slamming the CPU, the new Tiger Lake design is much faster. When comparing Intel and AMD, our 11800H system includes an RTX 3070 at 90 watts, compared to our 5800H system with an RTX 3060 at 115 watts. Based on other testing, the 3070 at 90 watts is about 6% faster, and in this benchmark the Intel system is about 3% faster. We'll learn more with equivalent GPU configurations in future reviews, but the main takeaway here is that either CPU choice is quite suitable for DaVinci. In the Puget Systems export test for Premiere, the 11800H is slightly slower than the 5800H configuration, despite having a slightly faster GPU, but outside of that there don't appear to be significant differences in this workload. However, the 11800H does provide a performance gain over the 10870H, which lagged behind Ryzen despite featuring decent GPUs in some of the configurations we tested. The Puget benchmark also reported higher live playback performance and similar effects performance compared to Ryzen. We're also seeing about a 10% performance improvement in Adobe After Effects when comparing the 11800H to the 10870H, which like many of the other CPU plus GPU workloads, puts us in the ballpark of AMD's new processors. A lot of these applications rely heavily on GPU acceleration, so again, whether you go Ryzen or Intel this generation seems to make little difference at a given GPU performance level. Now for some head-to-head -head comparisons. The Cry 7 11800H is clearly a much faster processor than the Cry 7 10750H due to its inclusion of two extra CPU cores, higher IPC, and better efficiency. Single-thread performance improvements range from 15 to 30%, while multi-threaded gains are as high as 50% in some workloads. Anyone that has been using a prior 6-core laptop, including CPUs as far back as the Cry 7 8750H, should be considering an upgrade to a more modern 8-core model. Core for core, the Cry 7 11800H is also faster than prior 10th gen designs. Single thread gains are large, but even outside of that you can expect a 20-30% performance improvement over the Cry 7 10870H at the same power level. In comparison to AMD's Ryzen 7 5800H, the battle is much closer. The 11800H is the faster processor for lightly threaded workloads, but the performance difference is in the low single digits, which we generally class as pretty negligible. Meanwhile, multi-thread performance ranges from about even with Ryzen up to about 15% slower in the worst cases. At times for multi-threading, the 11800H is up to 10% slower than even the last gen Ryzen 7 4800H. Next up we have power scaling with a look at how a selection of Intel and AMD parts fare when running above their stock 45 watt power limits. 
The benchmark here is Cinebench R23 multi-threading with boost disabled, so we're running exclusively at the long-term power limit shown here. With AMD's Ryzen 5000 line and Intel's 10th generation, power scaling behavior was quite similar, tapering off after about 60 watts, but continuing to rise with a similar margin between the CPUs. While we weren't able to run our AMD systems above 75 watts in the entry-level laptop we use for testing, generally speaking, a Ryzen 5000 laptop will have a similar performance gap on a 10th gen laptop at any given power level. But that's not the case with the 11th generation. The Cry 7 11800H displays notably different power scaling behavior, with a much more linear increase as power increases. Intel's new Tiger Lake design, built on 10nm Superfin, is much more efficient at utilizing high levels of power relative to 10th gen, not tapering off until we get into the 90 watt range. While their Comet Lake design tended to need a lot of power to increase the all-core frequency by a small amount, Tiger Lake has far better scaling thanks to a better balance of frequency versus performance, thanks to higher IPC overall. Where does this leave the 11800H versus AMD's 5800H? Well, in the lower power range, approximately 35 to 60 watts, AMD's design is clearly more efficient and keeps a similar distance away from Intel. In this range, Intel tends to need about 20 watts more power to match the performance AMD provides in this benchmark. But in the higher power range, the performance gap shrinks as the 11800H is relatively more efficient in this class. Up around 80 watts, the 11800H only needs 10 watts more power to match AMD, and I suspect somewhere around 90 to 95 watts, the two parts would perform equally. What this means for laptop buys is that in slimmer, lighter systems with less cooling, a Ryzen 7 5800H will deliver better performance at the lower wattage levels the design is capable of. In larger, beefier, high-end machines that can sustain upwards of 80 watts on the CPU, the performance gap between Intel and AMD could close a lot. Generally, these sorts of systems are your 17-inch you know, RTX 3080 type machines. The final set of testing we have for this video is a brief look at gaming. Like I said earlier, I really want to get an equivalent GPU in an Intel laptop to the Ryzen systems we've already tested so we can properly measure gaming performance, but the results we have in a small selection of CPU limited titles are still worth looking at as a performance preview. Resident Evil 2 is fairly CPU limited when gaming at 1080p. In this title, the Core i7 11800H and Ryzen 7 5800H deliver about the same level of performance, which is an improvement over prior 10th gen laptops. Hitman 3's Dartmoor benchmark is another quite CPU intensive game workload, and it's a better result for the 11800H here. Performance is more in line with the Ryzen 9 5900HX in this game, slightly outperforming the Core i9 10980HK, although please be aware of the GPU differences. Death Stranding is another title where the Core i7 11800H delivers about the same performance as the Ryzen 9 5900HX in a benchmark pass that is largely CPU limited at 1080p using the very high preset. CSGO is the most favorable result for Intel that I've benchmarked so far, easily beating the Ryzen 9 5900HX by 15% in average frame rate, which matches the upper end of the productivity results that we've seen. In Grand Theft Auto V, the 11800H matches the performance of the Ryzen 9 5900HX in average frame rates, but is slightly behind in 1% lows, using 1080p low settings, which is fully CPU limited. And then in Civilization 6, again, performance is very similar between the Ryzen 9 5900HX and Core i7 11800H when testing at 1080p using low settings, giving us a CPU limited experience. Both configurations are faster than a last gen Core i7 10870H laptop in this game. Overall, the Core i7 11800H is a substantial update for Intel in the H series laptop market. In the prior generation over the last year or so, AMD has absolutely dominated in terms of performance with Ryzen 4000 and then 5000. But with Intel finally able to transition away from 14 nanometer to a new process tech with a new architecture, they've managed to close the performance gap and be far more competitive as a result. The Core i7 11800H delivers 30% more performance than an equivalent 10th gen part with 8 cores, and around 50% more performance than the 6 core Core i7 10750H, which is a massive jump for productivity. This is all thanks to higher IPC, improving single thread performance, and also a much more efficient design and process that allows better performance at any given power level. While Intel are delivering some of the largest gen-on-gen -gen gains they've provided in recent memory, the battle between the Core i7 11800H and a competing AMD part like the Ryzen 7 5800H 
is more complicated. AMD's lead in the prior generation was substantial, and ultimately, even with this new design, Intel is unable to match the 5800H in productivity performance. The gap has shrunk significantly, but in heavy multi-core workloads, the 11800H is typically 15% slower or thereabouts. This isn't the case in every application, and there are times where the 11800H is either slightly ahead, slightly behind, or equal, plus a few outliers of course, but when you combine these cases with slower, heavy multi-threading, the overall balance for productivity lies with AMD. For Intel to match AMD, it either needs to consume 20 watts more power, or be competing in a much higher power class where Intel can leverage their superior power scaling. On the other hand, the Cry 7 11800H appears to be great for gaming, matching the performance of AMD's tier above Ryzen 9 5900HX in the CPU limited titles we've looked at. This will require further investigation with properly equivalent GPUs, but the signs are suggesting that Intel will be extremely competitive for gaming at the very least, if not faster. Beyond this, Intel has also got the advantage of a superior platform in laptops right now. AMD is struggling with supply constraints, so you'll probably find it easier to buy an 11th gen laptop than a Ryzen 5000 laptop in the next few months. On top of this, there are more Intel-based OEM designs to choose from, increasing your chances of finding a suitable laptop that uses Intel. Then you also have a few minor technical advantages like PCIe 4.0 and Thunderbolt 4 that AMD doesn't have. Personally, I don't think the PCIe difference is that significant right now, but Thunderbolt is obviously a much requested feature. However, at the end of the day, there's also an important piece of the puzzle that we haven't talked about, and that's pricing. Based on what we've observed in the market, just from actual laptop prices, and learned from discussions with OEMs, Intel's platform is more expensive to implement, so you'll have to spend more money on an equivalent Intel configuration. We're already seeing in the entry to mid-range market that a Ryzen 7 5800H system, with the same specs as an Intel Core i7 11800H system, is retailing for several hundred dollars less, and at times even Ryzen 9 5900HX builds are cheaper. When factoring this in, AMD does appear to have a clear edge in productivity, where you'll likely be able to find a faster 5800H based laptop for cheaper. That's what I'd buy for creative applications. In gaming, Intel's performance advantage appears to be eroded somewhat by the pricing discrepancy, so the fact it's near a Ryzen 9 processor in performance is a bit moot if they are a similar price. In that sense, it makes it hard to recommend one platform over another as both end up very competitive, and it will end up being different things that may sway you to one platform or another. And that's really the tale of today's review. Intel is now much more competitive in the H series with the Core i7-11800H, and that's only a good thing for the market overall, as competition tends to deliver great things for consumers. Anyway, that's it for our first review of Intel's Tiger Lake H45 processors. Hopefully we will be able to get around to testing the Core i5 and the Core i9 models at some point. Those scaling benchmarks for those two CPUs should be pretty interesting up against other processors that we've tested. If you're interested in supporting our laptop testing, you can of course sign up to our Patreon or Floatplane accounts. Links to those are in the description below. If you sign up to Floatplane, you will get some of our videos early access, which is a nice little bonus there. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.